Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for another opportunity to come together to study your word. Lord, today we'll be looking at the mystery of the iniquity that comes through the spirit of the Antichrist. We are asking in the name of Jesus for the spirit of revelation and for the spirit of wisdom. Lord, unveil the scriptures to us that even as we are reading them, each and every one of us will have a deep understanding of what you want us to understand. We pray for the spirit of wisdom. Wisdom is the correct application of knowledge. It's knowing the right thing to do at the right time and in what way to do it. We ask that you would give that to us, Lord, that by the end of this lesson, we would have been transformed and changed for the better. Lord, we pray that this word will not stand against us on judgment day. It will not be that we went through this word and we still allowed the spirit of the Antichrist to work in any one of us. Father, help us in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So let's go to our slides for today. Like I said, our topic is the mystery of iniquity. So as we start, let's start with definition of terms so that we can all agree on what we mean by what we're meaning. A lot of um, us older people, when we were growing up, we had a lot of mystery books that we read. Anyone my age will remember things like The Famous Five, Nancy Drew, um, The Hardy Boys, and and all that, and Sherlock Holmes, and things like that. We, We grew up reading a lot of mysteries. We like it. And human beings like mystery. We, we like things that are a bit not very clear. We, it raises our interest. And so what is a mystery? When we say something that is a mystery, number one, we're saying it's strange. It's not the usual. It's not what we're used to seeing. It, it's, it's not very much according to the normal um, trajectory of life. It's, it's something strange. When you look at it, you think, hmm. I'm not sure I've encountered this before, and I'm not sure I understand it as well. So a mystery is something that is not yet known. It has not yet been explained, or it it, it hasn't as yet been understood. So keep that word, mystery. It's strange. We, We don't really understand it. We don't really know it. And then the second part of our topic for today is iniquity. So when you read the Bible, you will see the Bible mentions um, three ways of offending God. It talks about sin, and sin means merely to miss the mark. If you think about people who are playing darts, and and they throw the dart at the dartboard, imagine somebody's throwing a dart at the dartboard, and then misses the board completely, misses the bullseye, and hits the wall next to the board. You know, when you see people who are skilled at throwing darts, it looks easy. But if you try it, if you've got no skill, you will see your arrow going completely away from the bullseye. So iniquity, sorry, sin is when we miss the mark. It means God has a standard. God has an expectation about how we ought to behave. And then you miss the standard. You're not quite up to the standard. You're beneath the standard of sin. And then we see another word in the Bible, transgression. Transgression means that God has put a boundary in place and you have broken the boundary. So the boundary might be, um, you shall not tell lies. And then you tell a, a little lie, a blue lie, a, light, a white lie, or whatever. You've, you've, you've transgressed the boundary. Boundary is there. It's like a fence that God has put up fences, you know, to protect us so that we live a life that is organized. And anytime we break that fence and do something that is outside our boundary, it's transgression. Now, there's something else that the Bible lists, iniquity. So, iniquity is different from sin. It's different from transgression. Iniquity means that there is now a pattern of illegality. What is being done is continuously illegal. It's a violation of the law. It is wickedness. When we talk about iniquity in the Bible, we mean something has become twisted. It's become distorted. So, for example, in our family lines, in our bloodlines, you might find that there is something that is a unique behavior that is unique to your family. I'm not talking about a good thing. I mean something negative. In some families, for example, it's anger. They are very good at being angry and acting on the anger. And some of them might act overtly, shout everywhere. Others might act passive-aggressive. They become angry, they suck, they don't speak, they ignore people. It's anger, 
it's manifesting differently, but it's the same thing. Then when you trace that person, you find that their mother was the same. She walked in anger. You trace their grandma. Their grandma was the same. Their great grandma. So it's been going on in the family anger. In the Bible, we, we, we see the example, for example, of, of Moses. Moses comes from the tribe of Levi. And in, in Genesis 49, when, um, when Jacob, Israel, their father, was about to die, he was releasing blessings and prophesying about the futures of his 12 sons. And when he got to Levi, you know, he says, Levi and Simeon are brethren of cruelty. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitation. Oh, my soul, do not come into their council. Because in their anger, they killed people. They killed a whole town in their anger. He said, cursed be their anger because it was very cruel. That's Levi. Later, later, you see Moses in the tribe of Levi being so angry. When God says, speak to the rock, he beats the rock. And beating the rock might sound to us like, so what's the big deal? But beating the rock was like symbolizing trying to crucify Jesus two times. He was crucified once. We can't try and kill him the second time. Any time a child of God begins to have a behavior that is a pattern, it's consistent, it doesn't end, and it's a bad behavior, it's like we're killing Jesus for the second time. Because he already died the first time for our sins to be cleansed. But when we persist in patterns that are distorted and twisted, that is iniquity. So you can see from the definition that iniquity is something very, very serious. It's something grave. It's something that we cannot ignore. Because if we ignore it, it might shut off the kingdom of heaven from us. When you look at iniquity, how it works, the mystery of iniquity... You know, the Bible says in Hebrews 11.1, 1, Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So, faith is an invisible force that is able to bring good to manifestation. Faith takes that prayer request. It takes that word of God. And it works in a manner that is invisible to our human eyes, but it brings it to pass. It causes good things to come to happen. Iniquity works in the same way but opposite. It is a force that activates wickedness. It is a spiritual substance that activates evil. So it's there. It's lying there inside your DNA. It's lying in, in, in the lineage, in the family history. That's why when we have children, when you see your child begin to behave like yourself, and sometimes you begin to pray seriously. Because you're seeing that they're trying to, to answer the call of the pattern of iniquity. Yeah? Iniquity is not something that doesn't touch anything or bring anything. It produces evil. And we see this in the Bible, in Ezekiel. Can somebody help us open Ezekiel 28, verses 15? If possible, can you read for us the New King James Version? Ezekiel 28, if we read from verse 15 to 18, please. Is somebody there? New King James Version, please. Are you there? Ezekiel. Thank you, Destiny. Ezekiel 28, 15. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. So iniquity was found in you. 15 to 18, please. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid before you before kings, that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. Thank you. That passage is talking about Lucifer. Lucifer, who was an archangel. The Bible says he was, co he was the covering cherub. It says you were perfect in all your ways until iniquity was found in you. 
and the iniquity inside of Lucifer led him to begin to engage in dealings that were sinful until the fire of God came out in judgment, judged him and threw him out of heaven. That shows us that iniquity cannot be just kept like that. We cannot hold it inside because as long as it's inside, it's going to come out and destroy. And obviously God has to also judge iniquity. Iniquity is the characteristic of the devil. Lucifer has iniquity and he's here now on planet earth. He has fallen angels working with him. He has evil spirits working with him and they are all functioning under that umbrella of iniquity. If you and I have iniquity, we become attractive to them and they find a connection with us. So our own goal as children of God is to come under the cleansing blood of Jesus, come away from iniquity so that Satan and his agents have nothing to hook us with. If we have iniquity, they will definitely connect with us. And we'll still talk about how iniquity is linked to lawlessness as we go on. Please, let's go to our next slide. So, when we talk about iniquity, it's like it impregnates the spirit of the human being. So, you remember David in Psalm 51. When he was praying that famous prayer, have mercy on me, O Lord, according to the multitude of your mercy, according to your tender mercy, have mercy on me. And then he says, I was conceived in iniquity. What does he mean? He meant that in every human being, since the day that Adam was cheated by Satan, since the day Adam and Eve were cheated by Satan and they fell, from that day, human beings had inside of them a seed of iniquity. So when you are born, I know that in ordinary human society, we will say, oh, you know, babies are innocent. Babies are innocent. Yes, babies are innocent. If a baby dies, they're going straight to heaven. But that baby is born with a wiring for rebellion, a wiring for sin. If you have children, you have never taught them to say no. But they'll start saying no to good things. You have children. You've not schooled them to tell lies. They'll start lying. Why? Because it's wired in the human DNA, this iniquity. So it impregnates the spirit. And in that very instant, all of the spiritual data or the spiritual inheritance of evil is established in the person. So when you are conceived, there is a data. Your, your DNA is not like blank. There is a data from your father's side. There is a data from your mother's side. And it's been going on from generations since Adam and Eve. If they've been sinning. So in some families, they are drunkards. Everybody loves beer, loves uh, whatever. Some people are taking drugs. Uh, generation after generation. That, that, that wiring is inside the DNA. And it, it, the spiritual data is transferred into that new baby. And then that iniquity operates like a spiritual umbilical cord that connects people to the behaviors of the family that they are connected to. Until you cut it off. When you give your life to Christ, you are meant to cut off that link of iniquity and say by the blood of Jesus, if this family is known for being, I don't know, sexual perverts, I refuse to be the same. If this family is known for being drunkards, I refuse to be like that. If my mother, my grandmother were cruel people that everybody hated, I refuse to be like that. If my father, my grandfather, they were all liars and cheats and swindlers, I cut it off, I refuse to be like that. Are you with me? If we don't cut it off, you will see that this person just resembles their dad. Or they just resemble their mother. They just resemble their auntie. You know, I was looking at the family tree of, of somebody who's in my extended family. And we saw how much this person has struggled with addiction. And we thought that it's just because, oh well, you know, because she grew up in London and there were this and that, that, and in university they got into this and that, and that's why they're addicted. But then when we looked at the family tree, we now saw that this person, in their bloodline, everybody had addictions. At least one person in every area. So when you look at her mother's um, 
like level on the family tree addictions you look at her grandmother's level addictions you look at the great grandfather addictions and her own child now has an addiction that's not that these people are just strange or just choose to be addicts there is something that has been passed on so that spiritual umbilical cord connects the person to all that um evil and it keeps going it keeps going until it is cut off so this is how the twisted, sinful legacy of humans is imprinted and passed on to their children. And these children will in turn twist it further by their own sins and they pass it on as a button of influence and consequences to subsequent generations. So for example, if we start in the Bible with Father Abraham. Father Abraham, there was a day there was a famine, pressure. Most times we see our iniquity patterns when there's pressure, when there's stress. When things are not going well, when you are pressured or people step on your foot and then the real iniquity begins to, to flow. So Abraham had the pressure that there was famine. And then the Bible says he went down to Egypt. You must notice in the Bible, every time people go to Egypt, it says they went down. Because Egypt represents the world. It represents the systems of this world. How people who are not born again behave. How people who are not born again think. And the system of the world is different from the system of the kingdom of heaven. So Abraham is faced with lack and famine. And he goes down to Egypt and begins to behave like a worldly person. Not a person who met God. Remember God has already met him in Genesis 12. And started a covenant with him. He goes down to Egypt. When he gets down to Egypt. The, the, the system of Egypt says. Look. If you are a husband. And you are in a position that you are not powerful. And you have a beautiful wife. The system of Egypt says. We will kill your beautiful wife. And, and steal her from you. Or we will take her from you by force. And you will be left with no wife. Whatever. That was the system of the world. So Abraham begins to behave like a worldly person. Gets to Egypt says. My wife Sarah is gorgeous. Am I going to wait for these people to take her from me? I'm going to lie and say she's my sister. So he lied, yeah? And then it got to Isaac. Isaac was not there when Abraham was lying, saying my wife is my sister. Isaac, pressure came as well. Famine came. And then he went to stay in the world amongst unbelievers. And he got there, he also lied and said his wife was his sister. His own lies were worse. Abraham maintained. He acted like he was the brother to his wife. So that means he never touched his wife in public. He never did anything that made him look like this person is married to me. And sincerely, Sarah was his half-sister. Because you know in those days, they didn't have enough population, so they had to intermarry. Sarah sincerely was his half-sister. So his own life was a less dimension. But he gets to Isaac. He has no sisterhood with Rebecca at all. And then, on top of saying he's his sister, he's canoodling and cuddling her and kissing and caressing in public. And then he was found out. His lies were worse. And then Isaac has his son Jacob. Jacob, remember, the twisting keeps getting worse. By the time it gets to Jacob, Jacob is already a swindler from the womb. He's already cheating Esau. He's already lying from the womb. He was born like that. And then you say, why would Jacob cheat on his brother, you know, steal his birthright? But why would we blame Jacob when there's already a DNA of lying and deception that is flowing in his bloodline? So must Jacob remain like that? No. That's why Jesus came. But we need to be aware of that mystery of iniquity. That lawlessness that Satan tries to wire inside of us. Can somebody read for us, please, Exodus 20, verse 5? Exodus 20, verse 5. Exodus 20, verse 5. If you're there, show me your hand, please, if you're there. Exodus 20, verse 5. Nancy's got a hand up there at the back, please. Exodus 20, verse 5. We're still looking at that transmission of iniquity. Exodus 25. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected. Even children in the third and fourth generations 
of those who reject me. So the Bible is clear that, that the punishment for the iniquity goes on and on until that sin is dealt with. And then the Lord was talking about worshipping other gods, you know. And any sin we are sinning, it's like worshipping the devil, really. If you will think about it, every time we rebel against God, it's like we're worshipping the enemy. And that iniquity passes to the third and fourth generation. And even we are being told now by neuroscientists, you know, by psychologists, by, by molecular um, genetists, that they found that, you know, we are carrying these things in our DNA. We are carrying things, even trauma, even anger, even negative emotions, unless we break it. So it goes to the third, the fourth generation. If we don't want our future generations to suffer, we have to deal with the business now. Don't wait for it. Don't wait for the pattern to be recycled and refuse as well for yourself to be a part of that pattern of iniquity. Amen. In the past, people used to say, you know what? God is so cruel. God is so mean. Why would he be punishing the children when they don't know anything about what the father did? But what, what we found out now is that it's not really about God being mean. Remember, God is just. He's already released his standard and the standard cannot change. But what happens is that as human beings, if, for example, I have never learned how to control my temper, what I will do is every time there's an incident, I will react in a way that is dramatic and horrific. But my children are watching me. They are learning how to react to situations. So they will learn it. And if God starts punishing them, it's not because God is mean. It's because I have taught them to be like that. Are you with me? It's in the DNA, yes, but also you are looking at examples. You are being brought up by people who are modeling to you how to behave. You've seen the children who their fathers are at the pub all the time. They too, as soon as they get to 16, 17, they are at the pub all the time getting drunk. It's like you are modeling that behavior and then it, it keeps going. It keeps going. Let's go forward. So let's look at our, our Bible um, next our Bible memory verse. It's taken from 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. Let's please um, read the amplified version. Remember here what these translations are, are writing as the mystery of lawlessness. In the King James, it's the mystery of iniquity. Okay? So let's take that amplified together. One, two, three, go. For the mystery of lawlessness, that hidden principle of rebellion against constituted authority is already at work in the world, but it is restrained only until he who restrains it is taken out of the way. Shall we read the last one, please? The New Living Translation. One, two, three, go. For this lawlessness is already at work secretly. And it will remain secret until the one who is holding it back steps out of the way. I'll explain this memory verse when we look at our Bible text because it's part of our text. Stuart, can we please go to our text? So here, Apostle Paul was speaking to the people in Thessalonica. And obviously, Holy Spirit is speaking to us today. That they were not supposed to get discouraged and become people who... It seems as if don't understand prophetic calendar and prophetic seasons. He wanted them to be in the picture of what's going to happen in the end time. He says, but relative to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and our gathering together to meet him, we beg you, brethren, not to allow your minds to be quickly unsettled or disturbed or kept excited or alarmed whether it be by some pretended revelation of the spirit or by word or by letter alleged to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has already arrived and is here. What Paul was saying here is calming people down because there had been some false teachers and some false apostles who were telling people that, look, you've missed the rapture. Jesus was already been and gone. And these people suddenly became hopeless. Imagine when you've missed the rapture. You've missed it. It's taken place. Jesus has come and gone and you didn't even know. What would then be 
you know, what would keep what would keep the hope alive inside of you? If if the Messiah, you know, has already taken everybody and, and you know, nothing is left. So Paul is saying, please don't allow your minds to be quickly unsettled. When some people start sending WhatsApp uh, messages or you know start doing, I don't know, TikTok videos, YouTube videos, teaching you a gospel that is telling you something else about the Messiah. Do not be unsettled. Don't be worried. He says, let no one deceive you or beguile you in any way. For that day will not come except the apostasy comes first. And what is the apostasy? Amplified explains it for us there. Unless the predicted great falling away of those who have professed to be Christians has come. And the man of lawlessness is revealed. Who is the son of doom, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself so proudly and insolently against and over all that is called God or that is worshipped, even to his actually taking his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming he himself is God. Bible is saying here, the second coming. So remember the first coming was when Jesus came and was born as a human and then he lived up to the age of 33 he was crucified, he died, he rose again, he went to heaven. That's the first coming. The second coming will happen at the end of the reign of the Antichrist. That will be what um, happens when Jesus comes for the final battle, the battle of Armageddon. The second coming cannot happen until these things have happened. Jesus is not going to... You know, sometimes Christians think, oh well, there's a day when everyone on my street will be born again. Everyone's going to just love Jesus. Oh, everyone. No, they are not. And the Bible says when we're going to, when um, Dr. Juru takes us into Matthew chapter 24, and we start to see the Sermon on the Mount of Olives, you will see that a lot of people in the church will backslide. Minus me. A lot of people will backslide because the Bible says, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many will wax cold. Remember, iniquity, we've defined it. The Bible is saying, in these last days, iniquity will abound. There will be lots of it. Lots of crooked families. Lots of people who've been badly brought up. Lots of people who are in rebellion to the word of God. You cannot teach them. When you teach them, in one ear, out the other. They do what they like. They come to Sunday school, you teach them, they ignore it. They know better. What you're telling me is nonsense. I have my own way. That is what we're talking about. Iniquity. Iniquity will abound. And the love of many will wax cold. That means many Christians are going to give up Jesus. And they'll go to Rihanna's concert and worship Beyonce. Yes, they've done it. It's not a curse. Some Christians leave the house of God to worship Beyonce and Rihanna and whatever else, little Nas or whatever. Person that when you look at, you can see they are miserable. Yet you are following them. They are on your phone. You watch them. You can see that they are in bondage. Somebody is punishing them. You want to join the punishment. That day will not come until apostasy comes. Until there is a great falling away. You come to church, you find that bishop so and so has given up being a bishop. He doesn't want to lead the church anymore. He wants to be in gay village on a Sunday. Great falling away. It's heartbreaking. But we must know this so that every day we don't treat our Christianity lightly. The people who are going to fall, it's not that they're stupid. It's because they've fallen under the mystery of iniquity. But if you know about it, you make up your mind. That me and my household, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. We will not be counted amongst those who denied Jesus and went back to our vomit. Amen? And then number two, it says, you know, Jesus is not going to come the second time unless the man of lawlessness is revealed. The man of sin. Who is that? The Antichrist. So don't be fooled when people say Obama is the Antichrist. Or so and so is the Antichrist. It's not true. Antichrist is not here. It's not Putin either. You know? When the, the, the Antichrist comes, he cannot come until rapture takes place. 
Because the Bible says in our memory verse, which we'll look at in a minute, that there's something restraining the Antichrist from coming. So he hasn't come yet. And when he comes, he will oppose God. He will exalt himself so proudly and insolently. He will stand and say, I, I am God. Who is Yahweh? Who is Yahweh? It is me who is God. Look at me. I do miracles. I raise the dead. I heal the sick. And the world will worship him. And that's a, a, an individual, a personality. Antichrist. He hasn't come yet. But the Bible says, Jesus will not come until the Antichrist comes. And if you remember our studies in the book of Revelation, when he comes, he will rule for seven years. And it's at the end of the seven years that Jesus will come. But the people who are raptured will have already been raptured in that seven years. So our goal is not to miss the rapture. Amen. Let's go forward. Paul said by the Holy Spirit, do you not recollect when I was still with you, I told you these things. Why would the Bible include this line? It's because us humans have a propensity to forget important things. He says, don't you remember? We've studied Revelation. We've studied the book of Daniel. We have Sunday school every Sunday. Don't you remember? I told you these things. It means that you and I, every time we finish Sunday school, go back and read it again. You finish Wednesday Bible study, go back and read it again. Don't miss it and say I'm busy. You're not more busy than Dr. Dury and I. Who's more busy than us? Show us your hand so we will sympathize with you. Anyone here who thinks they work more than the two of us? And yet every Wednesday we are there teaching the air because many of you are too busy. I'm saying this so that you feel bad. I hope you do. <laughs> You are not more busy than us. You need to be committed. You have an opportunity where some people are spending time to research and teach you. Be committed to hear. Because all these things, it's not a threat. On judgment day, God will remind you. Yeah? And if you fail, Satan will use it against you. Your church had Bible study. You never went. What were you doing in that one hour? I'm so busy. The one hour passed, all you did was scroll Instagram and TikTok. So, we need to remember the things we are taught. And if we don't bother to study the Bible, we will not remember. I can tell you now. I'm talking right now, making you feel bad. By 1 o'clock, after you've eaten Vera's birthday cake, you'll have forgotten. Unless you come back to it. Are you with me? Yeah. Sometimes, I, when you teach students at university, they are nodding their heads. You're like, yes, they got it, they got it. Exam zero. You know, say that. They never heard anything you said. They never heard it. We can't be like that. Because this thing pertains to our life. We, if we want to get to heaven, Bible says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's not going to be an easy ride. We need to be committed. Amen. Amen. And then he says, and now you know what is restraining the Antichrist from being revealed at this time. It is so that he may be manifested, revealed in his own appointed time for the mystery of lawlessness, the mystery of iniquity, that hidden principle of rebellion against constituted authority is already at work in the world, but it is restrained only until he who restrains is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be revealed and the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and bring him to an end by appearing at his coming. What is, is holding back the revelation of the Antichrist is the church. Remember on the day of Pentecost, when they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, that was the first time the Holy Spirit would indwell a human being. In the Old Testament, he used to come upon people, use them, they prophesy, they, they see visions, whatever. But after Pentecost, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. So as a Christian, you are not an individual per se, you are part of a body. Some are the hands, some are the legs, some are the ears, some are the watchmen, the ones who see, they can discern when devil is trying to invade the church. Some are the mouth, they speak on behalf of the body, you know. So we have different parts and all of us joined together, never mind denominations, every child of God, all of us together, we constitute an organism that is too powerful for the devil. And for this reason, the Antichrist cannot be revealed. As long as a church that is filled with the Holy Ghost is here, he cannot be revealed. 
Because he's the man of iniquity. He's the man of lawlessness. As long as there are people holding the ground, he cannot be revealed. But the day that Father God decides to rupture the church, take the church to heaven, what will happen? That power that was restraining the Antichrist will no longer be there. And at that point, he will step out. And the people who are used to rebelling against God are going to love him. They will love him. You know, they will love him. Some people write like memes and say, you know, the way they describe heaven, I don't want to be there. I want to be in hell. God forbid. Because they don't have understanding. They think it's a joke. When he comes, the world will love him. Because the Bible says, the mystery of lawlessness, that hidden principle of rebellion against constituted authority is already at work in the world. So right now, it's almost like Antichrist is grooming the world. You know how pedophiles groom children so that they desensitize them to the wickedness of the thing they're about to do. So they groom them over time. They're grooming them, grooming them until the child doesn't realize that the snake is about to bite them. So that mystery of lawlessness is grooming people for the coming of the Antichrist. He wants people not to be bothered about evil. To even celebrate evil. People love it. Oh, if on social media there's a celebrity doing evil things, they love it. They begin to trend. People love lawlessness. Anyone going against what God is saying, people love them. That's the mystery of lawlessness. So the more we love evil things, the more we love bad stuff, the more we are laying the ground for the manifestation of the Antichrist. And that's why we as children of God, we must reject this mystery of lawlessness. Anytime God, God is an authority, isn't it? We, we have to submit to him. Jesus, we have to submit to Jesus as the church. Holy Spirit, we have to submit to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And then in our different lives, we have various levels of authority. We have parents, you know, we have leaders. Whenever, unless the leadership is asking you to sin against God, do your best not to be a rebel. Amen? There is no rebel who makes it very far in the realm of the spirit. Because once you become a rebel, you've taken upon yourself the characteristics of Lucifer. Lucifer is a rebel. And when we become rebels, we can't bind him. We have no authority over him. We have no authority over anything. Our own authority comes from us being obedient to authority of God. Anyone who is against authority... You know, especially for the young people, you're about to um, get married, you, 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 you start dating or courtship or whatever, and the person you're courting, they fell out with your, their mother, they fell out with their dad, they fell out with their sister, they fell out with their brother, nobody can tell them anything, just run for your life. Because it tells you that that person is not going to go far in life, they're going to struggle, because they're a rebel. Rebels will not make it spiritually. And finally, the Antichrist has an expiry date when Jesus will come at the second coming. You know, the first time he came, he died as the Lamb of God. Not causing anybody harm, not fighting against anybody. But when he comes the second time, he's not coming as a Lamb. He's coming as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He's coming with a sword. He's coming in vengeance and judgment. When he comes at the second coming, there is no time to say, oh, uh, let me just bully Jesus like the Pharisees were doing. That season is gone now. When it comes, the Antichrist will be destroyed. And that will then start the period of the millennium reign. Can we have the next slide, please? The coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist, is through the activity and the working of Satan. So remember when we're studying Revelation, Satan is the power behind Antichrist. So like God the Father has Jesus, God the Son. Antichrist is like the son of Lucifer. Okay? And it says it will be attended by great power. In other words, the, the manifestation of Antichrist will be followed by great power. Anyone who thinks the devil is powerless is lost and sadly misled. He has power. The only thing is that our God has a higher power when we are obedient to God. But that Antichrist will come with all the power of Lucifer. He will go in great power. And the Bible says with all sorts of miracles, signs, and delusive wonders and marvels. 
People will be shocked. They'll be astounded. And it's already started now. A lot of people like going to magician shows and all this. They are astounded when the magician cuts the person into three and then separates them, puts them together. They're like, wow, they love it. When Antichrist will come, that's how they'll be loving him. Minus me, I won't be here. I will have been raptured. I'll be in the cloud of witnesses, singing in tongues in heaven. Amen. I pray I'll see you there too. Amen. That we will speak in Igbo, Ugo. <laughs> on Mount Zion. Amen. Amen. It says, the coming of the Antichrist will come by unlimited seduction to evil with all wicked deception for those who are perishing. There is a big, big, big force of seduction in the world right now. And when we talk about seduction, it's not just incitement to sexual sin. Seduction is really touching the deepest part of you and dragging you out to do something that is not in line with the will of God. Some people are seduced to become cold, cold Christians who are just, they pose no threat at all to the kingdom of darkness. In fact, kingdom of darkness don't regard them as born again. They just know that that one, oh, bless. If they pray, oh, the demons say hallelujah because there's nothing happening. Seduction. Seduction. There is unlimited, it says unlimited seduction to evil. So this must tell you and I every day when the sun rises, as you get out of bed, again you have to submit to God because you know that the battle has started. As you go through the day, there is unlimited seduction to do evil. Unlimited. Satan will come at all different angles. He just wants to get you to walk in evil. Wicked deception. You know, the modern society is good at making what is bad look good. And people who are doing evil are celebrated. For example, you know, I'm sure the people on Twitter will have seen the Twitter storm about much of the day. And what Gary Lineker is talking is the right thing. Cannot leave people, children, to be perishing in, 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 in the sea because of racism. He said the right thing, but because he offended the evil rulers of this country, who, because they are billionaires, they have no compassion, nothing, they don't feel anything for poor people. He offended them, and now Gary Lineker has got to be suspended from his job because he offended people who are evil. And some people are supporting the government and saying, yes, he has a contract to be impartial. You know, but you can see that evil things are celebrated in our society. People who do evil, they will be celebrated. And people who do the right thing will be slated. And we have to be careful to know this every day. Know that as I leave this house and go to work, go to university, go wherever you're going, know that you'll be faced with unlimited seduction and deception. Things are not always the way they seem. And then... It says people are going to perish because they did not welcome the truth but refused to love it that they might be saved. If we want to make it to heaven, we must choose to love the truth. Love what God is saying. When you choose to put the truth of God aside and love a system of the world, it means that you become part of those people who are doomed to perdition. May God deliver us from that thing in Jesus' name. It says because they chose not to love the truth. Therefore, God sends upon them a misleading influence, a delusion, a working of error. Every time they make a decision, it's the wrong decision. They want to get married, they marry the wrong person. They, they find the right person to marry, they don't follow the right channels, they marry differently. Everything they do is error because you've not loved the truth. Have you seen some people I know a person, this person got a very good job, very good job. And God opened the door for them. But every day at work, they are making mistakes. Silly mistakes, not big mistakes. Mistake after mistake. So every day somebody has a complaint about them. I know that very soon they will lose that job if they don't change. This is what we mean. When you're not in Christ, you make errors. You make mistakes. Satan pushes you to make a mistake. 
over and over. I read in the Manchester Evening News about a tragedy of this beautiful um, woman who was uh, killed by a partner. But what they found was the ex-partner was also abusive. The one before was also abusive. What is that error that makes you that every time you choose a partner, you choose the one who beat you up? It is an error. Spirit of God cannot lead you that way. So these are just examples. You can think up different ones. But basically, when we don't love the truth of God, when we don't take the truth and we say, this is what I love, this is what I want to live by, at that point you reject the truth. You start to get these delusions. You start to get this spirit of error where you imagine things that are never in agreement with the will of God. And every time, it's not like you're just choosing to be like that. It's because you are now wired under the pattern of iniquity. Remember the iniquity I mentioned before. When we don't love the truth of God, this innate thing inside of you is triggered and you start walking in error. And he says they have a strong delusion to make them believe what is false. A delusion is something people who work in psychiatry know that you can't reason anyone's delusions away from them. That's why even when you try and sit them down and say, sister, brother, look at what the scripture is saying. They can't hear you because they now have a strong delusion. And how did that happen? It's because once upon a time they heard the truth and rejected it. Our prayer is that all the truth that we know, we will not reject it. But we will accept that truth so that we will not walk in delusions and in error. It says that they walk in error in order that all of them may be judged and condemned who did not believe who refuse to trust in and rely on the truth. And you can see the truth there is capitalized. It's referring to Jesus, the word of God. He said, I am the life, the truth, and the way. When we take pleasure in unrighteousness, in other words, if you enjoy sinning, sinning is what you love. You are at home with sin. You've rejected the truth. Does that mean us as Christians were perfect? No. Because we are not yet at that point. We will make mistakes a lot. Yeah? We will fail a lot. But when you fail, you don't enjoy it. Yeah? I'm not saying put up your hands, but how many of you enjoy it when you'll be telling lies? It's uncomfortable, isn't it? Something is pricking you. It's not nice. How many people enjoy telling lies to their family, deceiving their people? Nobody enjoys it. How many people enjoy sinning when they're Christians? You don't enjoy it. And that tells you you are a child of God. When you feel bad about it, it's the proof of being a child of God. And we are able to be delivered from it. But the people who hate God enjoy sin. They love it. And that's not right. It means they will be ultimately led to hell. Because Lucifer's agenda is to take many people to hell. Hell wasn't created for humans. It's created for Lucifer and his fallen angels. Not for us. But they want us to join them. Shall we take a small prayer and pray for ourselves that we and our families, none of us will be going to hell. Shall we pray? And in the name of Jesus, we rely on the blood of Jesus. We refuse, Lord, to be trapped by the workings of Lucifer. None of us will submit to the mystery of iniquity in the mighty name of Jesus. All of us are born again and we are going to heaven. We are candidates of heaven. By your grace, Lord, we will make it. Our children will make it. We will not give birth to children who are lost. We will not have brothers and sisters who are lost. All of us will make it in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Stuart, let's quickly go through the outlines and then we'll close. So, Lawlessness is already at work, we know that. Antichrist spirit is working secretly in the background, leading people to rebel against God. There, there will be a great falling away, there will be apostasy in church, it's going to happen, but we will not be a part of it, amen? amen? The Holy Spirit, as manifested in the church, is restraining the full impact of the mystery of iniquity and lawlessness. Once the church is raptured, Antichrist will manifest, as the restraint will have been removed. That Lord Jesus will eventually come in the second coming and put an end to the law of iniquity. The rapture is not counted as the second coming. It's just an event because Jesus doesn't actually touch the earth 
and the rapture. The Bible says we will meet him in the air. So he hasn't come. Rapture, meet him in the air, go. Second coming, everyone will see the second coming. Everyone will know about it because he will physically come back on planet Earth. Okay. Any questions so far or additions? Amen. Let's go forward. I want us to move forward from this now, Stuart. Let's go to outline two. So, this outline is just reminding us, be watchful. Let's be watchful. Proverbs 4.23 4, says, Guard your heart above all things with all diligence, for out of it flow the issues of life. Guard in our hearts. God is not going to do it for us. We have to do it. How do you guard your heart? As soon as that thought comes into your heart, that is not consistent with the word of God. You don't sit there and analyze it and start looking at it this way, look at it that way. As soon as it comes, you shut it down with the word of God. I'll give you an example that I heard Kenneth Hagin giving about himself. He said once upon a time there was this pastor who had offended him. And when this pastor offended him, of course he let it go and released him. Sorry, an evangelist. So then this evangelist comes to their parish to minister one time. And in those days when people come to minister... You pass around a plate, you know, the offering basket, and people put in donations for the visiting minister. And that's how the visiting ministers are paid. That's how they, they live. So that passing the basket is very important because it means that if you don't give them an offering, a love offering, they might be hungry, them and their families, because they lived off that. So this evangelist comes to minister in his church. And he says as the evangelist was ministering, he had a, a thought inside he said, don't take up an offering for this one. Don't send an offering basket around. He said immediately he knew. That, that is not coming from him because he's born again. It's coming from the voice of the devil. So he said, Lucifer, I am warning you and your demons. If you speak to me again, you will see how much I'll give this man. And because you've already spoken like this, I will make sure I will not take just one offering for him. I will take in the morning, I will take in the afternoon, we will take in the evening, we will take all the days he speaks, we will give him more. If you speak to me about it again, I will add my own salary for this man on top of it. And bless him because he's my brother, I love him with the love of the Lord. What was he doing? Casting down every vain imagination. And every high thought that exalts itself above the knowledge of Christ, forcing them into subjection to the word of God. That's what 2 Corinthians 3 verse, sorry, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5 says. You get the thought. Just wake up in the morning and say, hmm. Huh, that's the Paris one the Bible study quiz. Hmm. <laughs> Why? Why? Huh? After all, don't they have enough money? I heard they live in the poshest area in Riga. <laughs> And then you now look at it this way and say, mm -hmm. oh, God showed you the answers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then you look at it this way. You know, by the time you finish with that thought, it can only end in wickedness. So when the thought starts, you're like, what, devil? Sister Paris is the rabbi of Stockport. We love her with the love of God. If you talk, we'll give her 2,000 pounds. Are you with me? So that's what the Bible means, guard your heart. It's practical things that every day you're not going to allow your heart to be telling you wicked things. Just look at your, your wife and say, isn't she okay, this woman? Is it me who married this kind of a thing? That's an evil thought, isn't it? Pull it down. <laughs> Alan who doesn't know what this thought is like because it never <laughs> enters his mind. Ah, he prayed for that person. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But this is just an example of how we guard our hearts. You know, there are many ways Satan wants us to be like him. And we don't want to be like him. Anything that you are thinking now that is not found in the Bible, it's not you. It's the mystery of iniquity. Cast it down. You are a child of God. You only think good things. When bad things start coming here, it's not coming from me. It's coming from the mystery of iniquity. The mystery of iniquity that I'm breaking, I refuse to follow it. Amen. God has already given us a new heart. 1 John 1 9 says, if you confess your sins, the condition, if you confess, if you do something, don't pretend it didn't happen. 
And listen, you don't have to broadcast it on Facebook and Twitter and TikTok that, look, I'm confessing I did this. Just tell God and be delivered. Sometimes Holy Spirit will say, go and apologize to the people that you've offended. You know, go and do it. It might take you 10 years, but make sure you do it. Don't do it after the rapture. It will be useless. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Child of God, no Christian has any reason to be guilty. Nobody here. No one should feel guilt of any sort because we have the scripture. Whatever I've done, if it's making me feel bad, I confess it. Blood of Jesus is applied to the sin and God forgets all about it. Amen. So you don't need to feel guilty. Anytime you start feeling guilty, know that devil is trying to punish you and refuse his punishment. Amen. Renew your mind. In Romans 12, from verse 1, it says, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. In other words, every day you take everything from your brain, your eyes, your ears, your hands, and say, all of you put together. I just bring you to obey God. Because this God will not do it on autopilot, will it? We have to make it. Present your body. Then verse 2, renew our minds in Christ Jesus. You know, we were brought up a certain way. All of us. There are things we've been taught from being little kids. And a lot of those things don't agree with God. You know, you've heard things like, God helps those who help themselves. But it's not in the Bible. But if you've been told it from being a baby, you believe it, isn't it? You got home from school one day in a certain place in West Africa. You told your mom and dad they beat me in school. And they said, what? Did you beat them back? You say, no. They said, what have you come here crying for? Beat you up. Go back to school and hit them. Next time they hit you, beat them harder. It's not in the Bible. But you will now still be having it at the back of my mind. Ah, why not they carry last? You know? <laughs> but God never said it. It's not in the Bible. So there are some things we've been programmed to think that we need to renew our minds. How? Come to Bible study. Read the Bible on your own. Listen to the word of God. Listen to godly songs that are based on scripture. Some of the songs we listen to are not based on scripture. Find the ones, old hymns of John and Charles Wesley. Listen to them and renew your mind. And then be diligent. If you're lazy, honestly, it won't work for you. Christianity is not for lazy people. We need to be diligent. That means it's not like a one-off. Oh, you know, this Sunday, ha, I'm on fire. Where's the Bible? Give me a Bible, somebody. I'm reading my Bible. And then the next time you pick it up again, it's August. <coughs> that, that won't work. We need to do it. Be diligent. Bible says, watch and pray. Yeah. The spirit is willing. The flesh is weak. Watch and pray. That's why we drag ourselves out of bed every 6 a.m. We go to prayer life. Because if we don't pray, we won't have the strength to resist what the enemy is throwing our way. But the more you watch, you are alert. Don't assume there's no devil. You know, some people are like, oh, I don't believe there's a devil. And I know there's good. And there's evil. Um, but don't believe there's a devil. If you're like that, war betide you. Woe betide you because there is a devil. Watch and pray. Put on the new man. You and I, we have a new man inside of us. Jesus has recreated a new being by the power of the Holy Spirit. However, we still have this, what you see on the outside, this Adamic container. If you are not careful, this Adamic container will make you like you're not born again. It will pretend it doesn't know that you have a new man. So you have to consciously say, look, patience, you are born again. Put on the new man. What is the new man? Walk the way Jesus wants you to walk. Be exactly what God wants you to be. Keep reminding yourself. And we have to do that regularly. Verse 6, depart from iniquity. You see the pattern. It's evil. Don't tolerate it. Leave it. Get away from it. Don't say, well, everybody's doing it. I, I'm not the first one to do such a thing. Uh, well, everybody. No, you're not everybody. Let everybody go to hell, but you must go to heaven. Let your garments be spotless 
Have you seen when somebody is wearing a white dress or white pants, white shirt? Do they mess about with things that could stain it? They are careful, you know? If you're wearing dark colors, you don't care where you sit. You don't even clean the chair. Um, you can be squirting tomato ketchup everywhere. But if you were wearing a white shirt or a white dress, you won't let those, my friends from children's church, be squirting ketchup everywhere. You won't have it, would you? Same as we are in our spirit, we are dressed in white. Don't let people squirt their ketchup on you. They're trying to, you know, initiate you into evil things. Don't accept it. And don't accept yourself to become the weapon that is fashioned against you. Don't become the tool that Satan uses to destroy you. Let our garments be spotless. Let's go to conclusion, Stuart. Thank you. So, we must not be discouraged by the mystery and outworkings of iniquity. Why mustn't we be discouraged? God has already made a way out for us. The blood of Jesus can cleanse our bloodlines of patterns of iniquity. Remember 1 John 1 9. It's the first verse I learned when I was born again. If I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. So, you've done that. what you shouldn't do. You go back, you confess. Blood of Jesus washes you. Now, this verse doesn't mean that you willingly plan a sin. You plot it. You buy the gun. You prep the gun. You load it with bullets. And you go and shoot your neighbor. And then after you shot them, you say, oh, blood of Jesus, blood of Jesus. No, that's not going to work. We are talking here about sin that you didn't deliberately plan. If you are planning sins like that, you are buying guns for your neighbors. You need to be born again. You need to give your life to Christ. Amen. Do not become hardened in sin as it leads to apostasy and the forming of strong delusions and erroneous ways of thinking and believing. So, when Holy Spirit is, um, you know, conscience is talking to you, you've told another lie. Stop lying. Don't be like, hmm. some people get paid to be liars. They live in Downing Street. Nothing happened to them. They are billionaires. You people who've been telling the truth live in the projects. You live in the council estates. What good has come out of your truth? If you keep ignoring the promptings, you will become hardened. If you keep repeating the sin, God is warning you. Stop it. No, God. Wait a minute. I'll come back to the blood of Jesus. Let me just finish my sin. Some people will say, let me put Christianity aside while they are beating people up. You know? And they just have this behavior of attacking people and being unpleasant. You can't do that. If you do that, you'll become hardened. And if you become hardened, it doesn't stop there. It leads to apostasy. Eventually, nothing bothers you. Has anyone ever seen some of those sky documentaries on prisons in South America or places like that? People there are hardened. They even love it if they kill somebody. They are in prison for murder. While they are in prison, they make sure they murder more people inside. They, they just love it. They love violence. They've become apostates. Once you, you harden your heart, you start to get delusions. Have you met some Christians who believe, believe crazy things? Like, oh, you know what? Um, it doesn't matter that um, I'm, I'm, I'm doing fraud um, as long as I paid my tithe. And they are ordained in the church. They are ordained deacons. And it doesn't matter that they are lying as long as they paid their tithe. That's what? Delusion. Some people think if they go to church on New Year's Eve, that day, pray for the whole year. They shouldn't bother coming back to church all year. They'll come again the next New Year's Eve. That's a delusion. Why bother? Just go and find a club to dance into the New Year. The antidote for rebellion and iniquity is obedience in Christ Jesus. That's the only thing that will stop us. Obey Jesus. And finally, let us be sober. Let us be vigilant and alert. That's what the Bible says so that we will not be swept away. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning. We ask in the name of Jesus that you will expand the word in our hearts and that you would deliver us, Lord, from the workings of the mystery of iniquity. Anything inside of us that doesn't look like you, Lord, purge it from us. Cleanse us, O oh God. Today, Lord, if any one of us is here 
and there's already a pattern of iniquity working in our lives. Father, collectively we put our faith together and by the power in the name of Jesus, we break the cycle. We break that evil wiring. We break the evil programming. We break it in the name of Jesus. Whatever is wiring us to make errors, Lord, any strong delusions we have about anything, we come against them by the blood of Jesus. Lord, we pull down the strongholds of rebellion and evil doing. We pull them down from our hearts. We pull them down from our minds. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen and amen.